Before you start listening to this podcast, we've got a special subscription offer. You can get 12 issues of The Spectator for £12, which will give you full access to everything on our website. And we'll also throw in a free £20 Amazon voucher. Just go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher if you'd like to get this offer. Welcome to a new Spectator podcast. I'm Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator. Um, We always reckon that each magazine is read by about two or three other people, where people give it to their family members, their friends, when they finish reading it, the magazine can get passed around, but probably not very much right now in this era of self-isolation. So we decided that for those who would normally read the magazine but might not get a copy now, we have asked our columnists to read out some of their work. So for this week's magazine, we have Douglas Murray, Tanya Gold and Mark Mason. Here's Douglas Murray to start. Below the crisis, a question floats. Where do we find purpose? By Douglas Murray. Perhaps we are at least past the beginning of this crisis, the phase where the hunt for multipacks of loo rolls briefly became the national sport. Now we are into the second, perhaps even less glorious stage, in which we all have to sit in our solitude and hope that the storm blows over us. And if this passivity is the great demand of our generation, a demand that brings its own ironies, then now is a good time to ask the question, how do we spend our time well? The question is one we ought to ask more throughout our lives, but the truth is that most of us tend to ask it only at moments of personal crisis, when a job or relationship suddenly ends or a loved one dies. By asking how do we spend our time well, I do not, of course, mean simply how do we keep ourselves busy? There are home exercise videos for that, even DIY if you must. I mean, how ought we to use this time meaningfully? An immediate urge will be, ought to be, to hold our loved ones close, or at least as close as we can in an era in which we cannot hold them. We will satisfy the need to call each other more, wave to each other more, and leave supplies, even luxuries, where we can. And if this crisis provides a surge in the strength of our networks of friends and family, then that is no small boon to stockpile. Even an engagement diary as empty as the roads can be rescued. I have taken to arranging virtual drinks with friends, diarying them in as I would in normal times. So I have drinks, or tea if the hour is not yet six, a rule especially worth adhering to now, with friends around the world. And I might remark that, as all drinkers know, bringing your own booze always ensures the best party. Family and friendship are not small things, and certainly not during these days. But still the question exists at a level beneath that. Where do we find purpose? There were many oddities about the world that was ours, but one of the oddest was that it chose to leave this question essentially unaddressed. Partly this was a product of the liberal story of emancipation, which proclaimed that we were getting freer and freer, but never said what we were meant to do once we had all this freedom, other than to be ourselves or find meaning where you will. There is a lot to be said for find meaning where you will. Certainly it is better than somebody else trying to impose their idea of meaning on you. But it is still a radically different thing from a message that says, and there is meaning. During recent years, much of our society found a purpose and a kind of meaning in politics. Even at the time, that period seemed curious. It was a period in which people who had no connection to the media felt that they needed to absorb minute-by-minute updates on everything. 
It was an age in which watches would beep, phones would buzz and tablets would ping with updates on things that few of us could affect and mostly wouldn't affect us. But it gave a purpose of a kind. Worlds away though they seem now, the stop Brexit and stop Trump crowds, and their opposites, had a distractingly busy few years. And if they didn't find meaning in the deepest sense, as in what I would look at with pride on my deathbed, they certainly found some of the best simulacrums around. There is a risk that this virus also becomes something to do, a thing which, however well or badly we ride it out, absorbs almost all of our time, thoughts and energies. The temptation is there in the regular news conferences and announcements. Each day brings new figures to absorb, new comparisons to make between countries. Hell, we've even had that hangover discussion about what to call the virus and whether referring to its origins is racist or not. Absorption in some or all of these things has already come to constitute a full-time job for many people, and I will say nothing about the number of undercover virologists who turn out to have been living among us all these years. Still, the question lingers. What ought we to be doing? Both during and after this crisis, I would expect the political left to once again prove their ability to provide narratives and explanations. Doubtless, at some point they will declare a great mission, and perhaps it will have its attractions a call to have more doctors or care workers, for instance, or an insistence that since we were all equal in the eyes of the virus, so we should be made more equal in other ways too. Parts of the political right will bang their own ideological drums. They will talk about the markets and much more, as if everything did not just change radically. In the era to come, who knows which of these people we will want to listen to if any. As a writer, I might claim to have been in training for this moment all my life. Solitude and silence have been agreeable, indeed vital, companions to me. And to that extent, recent days have not been that different from any others. Apart from performing the new chores we all must carry out, I spend my days as I always do at home. Inside, I migrate between my writing desk and piano. I enjoy the garden more. And yet, in the gaps that have opened up, the bigger question hovers. I suppose my own answer is a doctrine of a kind, which is that we are most likely to find meaning in the places where meaning has been found before. That what has seen our forebears through and nourished them will see us through and nourish us in turn. I don't listen to the news much. If the church is open, I will sit in it. I remake my acquaintance with great music. In the evenings, I read Anna Karenina. That was Douglas Murray, and here's Tanya Gould about the increasingly sensitive politics in Cornwall. The Cornish Revolt Against Second Homeowners they are not welcome in times of pandemic, by Tanya Gold. It was sunny on Monday, so I took the children swimming in Mausel Harbour. It was almost empty, but a woman sanding a boat on the quayside scowled at me. She couldn't hear the children's Cornish accents, which might tell her that I live here. There have been tensions for years between native Cornish and the incomers who buy houses and drape them with nautical-themed junk. With pandemic, they have developed into hostility. A sign appeared on the bus stop in Mausel. If you have travelled from a hotspot area outside Cornwall, like London, you are putting vulnerable people in this village at risk of death. Please come back when the virus peak has passed, until then travel is selfish and unkind. But it was grey and windy that day, and the sign blew away. Tourism brings £1.8 billion a year to Cornwall, and employs one in five people. Tin mining has gone, and fishing is declining, so the Cornish usually greet incomers, emmets or ants, with phlegmatic grace. But not when there is a pandemic, an ageing population, widespread ill health and only one major hospital at Trelisk. Cornwall has 15 critical care beds to serve a population of more than half a million. They had to release inpatients after going over capacity in January. 
They won't confirm the numbers of critical care beds available now. They don't want to frighten people. It's too late for that. It is widely believed that there is a case of coronavirus in Penzance and another in St Just, the most westerly town in Britain. As I write, there are at least 25 cases and 7 deaths. As I speak, there are at least 37 cases and 7 deaths. It is also widely believed that the route of infection is second homeowners. Still, we do our best. Grocers deliver to vulnerable people for free. We share information on where food is plentiful. Sainsbury's is still out of flour. What are they doing with it? But there is still plenty at Thorns Fruit and Veg in Long Rock. There is fear, but not despair. Cornwall has known misery before. She is used to relying on herself. In 1595, the Spanish landed and burned Newlyn, Mausel and Penzance. By the time the militia arrived from Plymouth, they had sailed away. When the schools closed, we believed that people wouldn't come for Easter holidays. The leader of Cornwall Council, Visit Cornwall, and the MP for St Austell and Newquay asked people not to come. So did the professional mermaid Laura Evans, but that counts for nothing. Photographs of long queues on the A30 were published with aghast comments. Mark Jenkin, who last month won the BAFTA for Outstanding British Debut for Bait, a film about gentrification in Cornwall, posted, Please don't come to Cornwall. We don't have the resources for us, let alone you. Bait has a dark ending, but any sequel may be darker. Gentrification has not so far led to mass death. It is usually more grumbling and looks. Bait star Ed Rowe said, Holidaying in Cornwall for the foreseeable future under the current circumstances could have a catastrophic impact for the people that live and work here. Bait star Ed Rowe said, Holidaying in Cornwall for the foreseeable future under the current circumstances could have a catastrophic impact for the people that live and work here. He quoted a doctor at Trelisk who simply said, Don't come here. The holiday cottages are largely empty. Responsible owners ask guests to come later in the year, despite the impact on their business. Holiday parks were pressured to close, sometimes with death threats. But the owners of second homes are here, ordering hundreds of pounds of groceries for delivery. I went to St Burian, where Straw Dogs, a very rude film about Cornish violence to incomers starring Dustin Hoffman, was filmed, to buy sausages at the farm shop. I saw Londoners in clean barbels and shiny land rovers staring at frozen pasties. On the way home, I saw a Bentley. I wondered if there were pasties in the boot. A Mausel resident told me, and that he spoke to me, a person who has only lived here for three years, is by itself unusual. It's busier than it would normally be at this time. Out and about today, there are strange faces using the shop and the deli. It's the same in St Ives. I overheard one woman say on the phone she hadn't realised the hostility. The long-term locals are really quite upset. They are trying to protect their own health. I think they are feeling threatened. It was worse in St Just, but it is a tough place, once a mining boom town with a population for a while larger than Manchester. Stories which I think are lies, but they don't bother to deny, tell that they throw unpleasant incomers down mine shafts, but only after a proper warning has been ignored. They are hardy and St Just, even for the Cornish. I was told that a resident approached a second homeowner. Have you seen the guidance on non-essential travel? No, so what? Well, you're not really supposed to be here. It's my bloody house, and it's our bloody hospital. Is that a proper warning? Now they are threatening not to sell food to the Emmets. They will be lynched, said the local butcher calmly, but, in the end, there was no time for lynching. The duchy is in lockdown, but the Isles of Scilly acted early, because they are used to peril. Four British warships and 1,300 men were lost there in 1707, with their admiral, Sir Cloudsley Shovel, the pub dog at the Admiral Bembo in Penzance is named for him. The Isles didn't wait for the government. The Salonian, which sails daily, brought college kids and local residents home before the announcement of lockdown on Monday. Others were not allowed to board. That was Tanya Gould, and finally, Mark Mason. Notes on Working From Home, by Mark Mason. Working from home has been on the rise for years. No one expected the latest surge to happen in the way it has, but now that we're here, what can we learn about home working from those who've already done it? The first rule, even when times are normal, is make sure you stay at home. Victor Hugo resisted the temptation to go out by ordering his valet to hide all his clothes. The Greek statesman Demosthenes achieved the same result by shaving half of his head. Whenever he felt the need for exercise, Cardinal Richelieu jumped over his furniture. But even at home, the scope for procrastination is endless. Any writer will tell you that the first result of a deadline is your ironing gets done. So you need a routine. The good news is that, unlike in the office, you can create your own. Honoré de Balzac rose at midnight and worked until dawn, when he treated himself to an hour-long bath. The latter element was copied from Napoleon, although Balzac also channeled the two Ronnies. He worked at a desk lit by four candles. 
Another good thing is that you can take your time to get things right, improving your work gradually rather than aiming for perfection first time. As P.G. Woodhouse finished each page of a book he was writing, he would pin it to his office wall at a height indicating how good it was. Pages still needing work were lowered down and after being rewritten would make their way upwards. The idea was to get the whole manuscript up to the picture rail. Food is tricky. You can use it as an incentive. The snooker player Steve Davis allowed himself a cheese and marmite sandwich only after potting a certain number of balls in practice. But too much incentivization will threaten your waistline. Mind you, the opposite problem can also arise. Isaac Newton sometimes concentrated so hard on his work that he forgot about his dinner and the cat ate it. Keep an eye on your caffeine levels. It's a good idea to use a small cup rather than a mug. Most of the time you're only making coffee as work avoidance rather than because you really want it. Learn from Tony Benn, whose mug held a pint of tea. He drank a mug per hour and ended up in hospital with polyneuritis. One advantage of working from home is that you won't have to put up with irritating colleagues, although you might start to find that you need them as grist to your creative mill. In this case, follow the lead of Henrik Ibsen, who had a portrait of August Strindberg facing his desk. I cannot write a line, said Ibsen, without that madman standing and staring down at me with his mad eyes. Inspiration can come in many forms. Hilary Mantel counters writer's block by taking a shower. Albert Einstein solved tricky problems by playing the violin as he contemplated them. Or you could take an afternoon nap. Winston Churchill favoured them claiming they allowed him to pack 36 hours' work into only 24. Ronald Reagan was another fan. However, the president left orders to be woken in case of an emergency, even if I'm in a cabinet meeting. That was Mark Mason, and that's it for the podcast this week. If you have any thoughts on the format, because we kind of just made this one up, then do email us at podcast at spectator.co.uk. Thanks for listening, and thanks to our producer, Cindy Yu.